We want to welcome you to 11.30 a.m. Wednesday lunch and Bible study at Doctrinal Studies Church out of Birmingham, Alabama. As many of you, at least those who have been following, we are in a current series called Quench Not the Spirit, which is taken from 1 Thessalonians 5.19. We're now in our, our third lesson uh, on this Quench Not the Spirit. In lesson one, we saw one of the ways that a believer can quench the Holy Spirit who indwells his life is by walking in the flesh, carnality, evidence of carnality is personal sin. Uh, could be mental attitude type, sins of the tongue, overt sins. Uh, Galatians 5, 16, 17. In lesson two, we looked at another way that a believer can quench the Holy Spirit is by putting them, their Christian life back under the Mosaic law. We saw that in Galatians 5, 18 and 19. And it's uh, important that you go back and study these lessons with us in order to stay current on the subject of the series, Quench Not the Spirit. In today's lesson, we're going to talk about one of the ways that you can quench the Spirit is by negative volition to the teaching and recall ministry of the Holy Spirit. The Holy Spirit, we're going to see today in our lesson text of John 14, 26, has been sent to the Christian life where he indwells your body, 1 Corinthians 6, 19 and 20, and your bodies become the temple of God on earth during the church age. This is an enormous concept. Never before, never before was this true where every believer would be indwelt. In the old covenant, he could dwell alongside but not inside. In this way, he is dwelling from the inside. His entire operation is in the life of a believer. That's, a, that's an enormous concept. And today we're going to see that one of the, and we've been talking about how not to quench. Remember that the word quench in the Greek language means to uh, put out a fire. And uh, wh where is that fire coming from? It's coming from the Spirit. Quench not the Spirit, talking about the Holy Spirit indwelling. And so the Holy Spirit's job is a fiery ministry uh, towards the planet of God on the earth. And he works out of the human body where the Holy Spirit indwells. Well, today we're going to look at one of the great ministries that he has in John 14, 26 is teach and recall. He's going to teach you the word of God and he's going to recall it. Both this is going to be important through your spiritual growth first for your own importance as a baby and immature believer. But as a mature believer, this concept is enormous because not all, all that feeding in is now going to be fed out. The teach and recall doctrines and help others uh, find this ministry of teach and recall for their life, and we become the teachers uh, of presenting the truth to people where it can take root in their life and the Holy Spirit can minister the teaching. So it's an enormous concept, teach and recall, John 14, 26. So if you look at that text for with me for a moment, then we'll have a word of prayer and get into our study. Jesus at the Last Supper in what's called the Upper Room Discourse, that's John 13 and 14, we're in chapter 14 when Jesus is teaching on the coming of the Holy Spirit. And when he comes, the comforter, the helper, the Holy Spirit, he will do many things. One of those he describes today whom the Father will send in my name, watch this now, he will teach you all things and bring to your remembrance all things I said to you. In other words, Christian doctrines. Uh, now he's speaking specifically to the disciples, but it becomes a principle within this church of the ministry of the Holy Spirit with the word of God. So, after a word of prayer, we're going to get into this, and we're going to look at the greater context of verse 26. Actually, this starts in verse 25 and goes through 31, which we'll look at in a moment. Quench not the spirit is the subject matter, 
And one of the ways we can is that the great teaching ministry, the fiery ministry of the Holy Spirit, one area is teach and recall negative volition towards the teaching and recalling of the Word of God in our soul. Negative volition is a way to quench the Holy Spirit in regard to the ministry of teach and recall. I want you to get that now. Negative volition. Negative volition to the Word of God can quench the Holy Spirit. And it can quench the teaching and recall principle, and we'll talk about it in detail today. Let's have prayer. Well, our Heavenly Father, we thank you for these that have come our way to study with us today. On Wednesday, 1130 luncheon, it's our luncheon Bible study. Normally, we would have the privilege to do it at the church with people breaking for their lunch breaks from work. But now we do it at home because of the COVID-19 virus. Not something we planned, Father, but something you planned. So we adjust our life to it and still carry on with the ministry. I pray the Holy Spirit would minister, teach, and recall in our life today and the danger of negative volition in the life of a believer towards the Word of God and how it affects the ministry, the internal ministry, how it puts out the fire of the ministry of the Holy Spirit in Jesus' name. Amen. Well, we'll look at four ideas today on quench not the spirit in regard to negative volition acting against the teach recall ministry of the indwelling Holy Spirit. Now, I want you to look at the context of John 14. I want you to look, at, we're going to start with verse 25. We're going to go through 31. And as I read it, I'm going to break it down into segments. I want, I'm going to do an outline of the context of my text. I do that because of homiletics and hermeneutics, because of hermeneutics and homiletics. Hermeneutics requires me to see what the writer says. Homiletics tries to explain to me how to lay it out in such a way that you might remember it or see it. So I'm going to put verse 25 through 27 in one section. That's titled, The Spirit. Spirit. These things I have spoken to you while abiding with you. In other words, Jesus is teaching under the ministry of this Holy Spirit. These things I have spoken to you while abiding with you. But, in contrast to me being with you and being the great teacher, the helper of the Holy Spirit, whom the Father will send in my name, he will become your teacher. He will teach you all things and bring thing, all things to your remembrance of what I've said to you. Recall. Verse 27. This is what it will do to your life and your soul. Peace I leave with you, my peace I give to you, not as the world gives. Do I give to you, let not your hearts be troubled, nor let it be fearful. What is the message? The importance of teach and recall of the word of God to your life. The things I've taught to you is important for you to recall. I'm going to leave. When I'm here, I'm a reminder of you to recall it. He, he spends all of his ministry life with disciples teaching and recalling what he taught. The repetition of solid basic doctrines. The job of the pastor teacher today. And what will it do for you? It will give you peace in troubled times. Let not your heart be troubled. Means there's troubled times in your life. In the life of the disciples, they were disturbed because Jesus in John 14, 1 said, I've got to go. In John 16, 7, he says, it's to your advantage that I go. And they were sorrowful about why he keeps talking about leaving and not returning right away. Where are you going and why are you going and where are you going to be and why are you leaving us? And their hearts were troubled. He said, I gave you the word of God. You're to abide. It abides with you. You abide with it. Recall it. It will stabilize your life in troubled times. Let not your hearts be troubled. That's verse 1 now recorded in verse 27. And what will it bring? Peace, inner peace, the peace that passes all understanding. That's our first idea. Jesus is leaving. The Holy Spirit is coming. The Holy Spirit would be the great teacher and recall of the word of God. 
what will that do? It will bring such peace to your soul, a peace that passes all understanding. Verses 25 through 27, the Spirit. Now when we come to verses 28 and 29, the word is the sample. He's going to give you a sample or an example. You heard that I said to you, I go away. I will come to you. If you loved me, you would have rejoiced because I go to the Father for the Father is greater than I. And now, I have told you before it comes to pass, watch this now, that when it comes to pass, you may believe. Now, get, get that. Because he says, I'm not going to be there, but the Holy Spirit's going to be there, and the Holy Spirit is going to be able to do, I'm giving you a sample of that now. I'm telling you now, I'm giving you a sample now of what he's going to do later that's going to cause you to believe what I'm telling you now that you're troubled with believing. Did you get that? Well, you may have to read it two or three times. You may have to read it two or three times. I love this part, verse 29. Now I have told you before it comes to pass. Who knew what was the future was the second member of the Godhead. Listen to me now. Who do you think knows the future in your life that's present with you? The Holy Spirit. That's the sample. And why is that good? That when it comes to pass, and it will, when it comes to pass, and it will, you will believe. Isn't that interesting? Could, listen to me because you're not believing now. Your hearts are troubled. You're all confused. I told you. But you went negative for what I told you. And the results, you've got a troubled heart. You're sorrowful about something you should be rejoicing in. But you can't. You know why? Because you've gone negative to what I've taught you. You've gone negative. You cannot do that when the Holy Spirit comes. He's there to teach and recall. If you go negative him, you're going to have the same experience. See, it's a sample. Or you might say an example. Now, here's verse 30 and 31. Satan, the adversary. Satan, the adversary. I will not speak much more with you, for the ru ru ruler of the world is coming. In other words, he's headed for Jesus. He's going to have a whole gang with him. And he has nothing in me but that the world may know. And he say, not you guys. See, he's been talking to them. Now he's talking to the world. Because Satan's coming to arrest him and crucify him. What he doesn't know is what the world doesn't know. It's, it's for them. When he dies on that cross, he's going to redeem the world. Redeem the world. Whoever believes. Well, the enemy, the ruler of the world, is coming. He has nothing in me. They don't believe in me, negative volition. But that the world may know that I love the Father, and as the Father gave me commandments, even so I do, arise, let us, even so I do, arise and let us go. You know what he's just told his disciples? The word of God will fight all your battles if you will believe it. The word of God will fight, listen. <laughs> The word of God will fight all your battles. Look, Ephesians, the sixth chapter, verses 10 through 17, he tells the Christian church, put on the full armor of God. And he talks about the armor, all defensive mechanism until he gets to verse 17. 
he talks about the offensive weapon of categorical Bible doctrine in the hands, in the life of a believer. A believer that just doesn't have a sword, a Bible, and carries around, doesn't know how to use it, but one who is an artsman of it, a, a person who really knows how to use the sword in warfare, the angelic conflict in warfare. Listen, a lot of Christians got a Bible, they go to church, they don't know how to use it. They can't use it in their own life. They're like the disciples. They don't know how. Jesus t teaches them. They're negative. They don't know how to use it because negative volition on truth that d disrupts their life. They don't want to hear it. They've got to make changes. They don't want to make changes. Is that you? I mean, are we speaking to you today? The sword, the sword is the word of God. It's not, it's just not you have its possession. You got to know how to use it effectively against the enemy, the, which is the ruler of the world. This is what Jesus is trying to tell us. And listen, we've been fully equipped by the grace of God. We have the indwelling power of the Holy Spirit, not only to teach us the word, to teach us how to use the word, but to give us the power to use it effectively. John 14, 25 through 31. In the midst of that is verse 26. <laughs> In the midst of this enormous study is this verse that I pulled out for us today, quench not the spirit, the teaching recall ministry of the indwelling Holy Spirit with the word of God. What a powerful idea. Jesus was teaching his own disciples of the coming advent of the Holy Spirit that would follow his death, burial, and resurrection and ascension. It would come at Pentecost when he would baptize that 120 that would turn into 3,000 and 5,000, and here we are today. Matthew, the third chapter, verse 11, Acts 1, 4, and 5, Acts 2, 32, 33. If you have a study guide, those are all there. If you don't have one, go to doctrinalstudies.com later and pull it down, and you can have all that I'm teaching is in print. During this teaching hour that Jesus is having with his disciples, he taught the messianic doctrine related to the coming of the Holy Spirit of teach and recall ministry, the fire ministry of teach and recall. Listen to what he said in John 14, 17. That is the spirit of truth whom the world cannot receive, 1 Corinthians 2, 14, the natural man can't understand. Because it does not see him or know him, that takes the ministry of the Holy Spirit. Jude 20, Jude 20. But you know him because he abides with you and will soon be in you. Isn't that powerful? Romans 8, 11. And how long would the Holy Spirit be there? John 14, 16 says, forever. When he takes up residence at the point of salvation, he's there forever. John 14, 16. Listen to John 14, 26 one more time. The helper, the definite article, whole with paracletas, the helper, the comforter, the Holy Spirit, talking about the indwelling of the Holy Spirit, whom the Father will send in my name. He will teach the dasco, future act of addictive coming. The, 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 listen, when he uses teaching, he's talking about doctrine. He's talking about categorical doctrine because the word doctrine, it, like in Titus 1.9, the daki is, comes off from, that's a noun coming off from the verb, doctrine from teaching. But you know him because he abides will soon be with you. And he says, oh, and you and he will teach you all things and bring to remembrance, future active indicative, recall all that I've said to you. Listen to John 16, 7. I tell you the truth. It is to your advantage I go away. My, my, my. Who would have ever believed that? That we're better off today with Jesus at the right hand of God the Father in heaven 
the head of the church and savior of the body than if he was here in person, personally. Think about that. Better off for him to run the show from heaven and the Holy Spirit to run it from earth. You got two members of the Godhead actively engaged in your life every day. You're better, we're all better off. It's to our advantage. I mean, how, how, how plainer could he tell you? For if I do not go away, the helper, the Holy Spirit, this third member of the Godhead, will not come to you and in you. But if I go, I will send him to you. How about that? And that occurred at Pentecost in 30 AD. I'm going to keep telling you that until somebody believes it. Point number two, the faith cycle. You got to hear the word of God. Faith comes by hearing. You got to believe it. You have to understand and believe because what you believe becomes your faith base of operation. Hebrews 4, 2, and 12. The Holy Spirit has to become resident in you by what you believe becomes your faith. But stool becomes pistos. Hebrews 4, 2 becomes Hebrews 4, 12. The word of God is alive, powerful, sharper, and a two-edged sword piercing to the, you know, to the joints and the marrows and the, the, down to the thoughts and intents of the human heart. And then it becomes a base of operation. The word of God becomes the base of operation in our life. It comes by hearing and believing, understanding and believing. Now we're ready to apply it because it's, it's part of our faith base of operation. Now we have 2 Corinthians 5, 7, walk by faith, not by sight. And that takes us to a place where it can now be completed, what God has promised, Romans 4, 12, 21, what he's promised, he is able to perform it. How does he do that? By our faith. Sometimes there's a waiting period between application and receiving. That's called the faith rest period. That's the waiting period. There's where your relationship with God gets solidly founded on the base that the, the base of operation, the, what you believe and has become your base of faith is now tested in another example, and that's the application that God will do what he's promised. It develops your relationship with God, both on the word and then the way the word works in your life. You can't be negative to it on either place. Now, on your piece of paper, it has H at the top, hearing, and then over here, going clockwise, it has believing, and then applying, and then around to completing, and then back to start the cycle again. This is how faith is developed in the Christian life. When you take teach and recall, you can draw a line between hearing and believing, applying and completing, you can draw a line through it. Like that. Draw a line through it. Listen to me now. This is important. On the hearing and believing side is the teaching side. On the applying and completing side is the recall side. The recall side. This is how this thing works. In 2 Timothy 3, 16 and 17, he says all scripture is inspired by God. That's inhale, exhale. On the hearing, believing side is inhale, and on the applying and completing side is exhale. This is the way the Christian life is lived. My goodness, people, you got to understand this stuff. Here's point number three. I know. Look, I know. <laughs> you go like, whoo, it's, I don't know. This is so much information. I've never heard this before. I know. This is why it's on tape. You may have to listen to it several times to get it. Listen to me. Listen to me. I have set where you set. I've set under this kind of teaching in my life. You may have to listen to, to this more than once to get it. Here's point number three. It is important to understand the role of human volition. 
it is important to understand the role that human volition plays in teach and recall ministry of the indwelling Holy Spirit. Now, the human soul is made up of self-consciousness, conscience, mentality, volition, emotion. That's a general view. If I could get you to learn that, I'd be happy. That's a general view. You know, the man is trichotomous. He has a body, soul, and spirit. The soul is what God saves. What will it profit a man? You know, what will it profit a man? What, what is the, what's the point? His soul. Gain the whole world and what? Lose his own soul. So, let me tell you, volition, <clears throat> which is a system in every human believing, believing, believing of freedom. Divine institution number one out of the five divine institutions established in the book of Genesis, one of them is freedom. And every human being born in the image and likeness of God has volition or freedom. The freedom to choose. Think about that. Now, I shouldn't have to explain to you that everybody has volition and can make choices. Our whole life every day is made up of choices. What do I want for breakfast? What am I going to wear? What am I going to do? The divine institution, number one, is freedom. It's established in the image and likeness of God. And every man has the freedom to choose. Now, what's important? That you choose God and that you choose the gospel of Jesus Christ. Because of Adam's sin, we're separated from the dynamics of the freedom we were created to experience. Galatians 5, 1 and 13 says, That, that, that Christ has set us free for freedom. We've been set free for freedom. That's Galatians 5, 1 and 13. Not to use our freedom as a believer for opportunities of the flesh, sin, nature, carnality, and personal sin, but to walk the walk with God. You know that Ephesians 4, 1. So you will never know the real sense of the greatness of the grace of God about freedom until you get saved. You know about freedom because you have the freedom to choose. You can choose not to believe or to believe the gospel of Christ. Choices. The freedom to choose. Now, in a believer's life, volition is a very key deal. It's a very big deal. The only time it's a big deal in the unbeliever's life is when he becomes God conscious to choose to stay positive to God consciousness. It will give him gospel hearing when he gets gospel hearing to get saved, to believe that Jesus died for his sins, was buried and raised from the dead the third day, and be saved. By grace through faith and not of himself be a gift, Ephesians 2, 8, 9. You understand that? Do you understand the importance of that? In the Christian life, these decisions, all these decisions we make is under the principle that everything in our life is an appointed time. Galatians, uh, if, uh, Ecclesiastes, third chapter. Everything under heaven in a Christian's life, everything in a believer's life is, is part of an appointed time. You, you better come to understand that. You should go re back and read Ecclesiastes 3rd chapter. Read all the way through it and see the significance of it. You will never know 
Now, listen, you could probably figure that out as an unbeliever when you look back and say, well, boy, it was really uh, good that, that I, was, when I, I made good choices and yeah, 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 yeah. But you don't seem to ever connect the dots. But as a Christian, you ought to be able to connect the dots because everything. See, we see events in our life that was significant. Oh, I remember the day I, I uh, graduated from high school. I remember the day I, I uh, scored a touchdown. I remember the day. But in the Christian life, what he's talking about in Ecclesiastes is the life of a believer who now lives under the appointed times of God in events. Appointed time of time and events in the Christian's life. Everything, every day, every, everything. The events, the time. The timing of the events are significantly important. It's important that we have eyes to see it and that we have volition that, that have the ability to be able to place our decision process and our volition in connection with the will of God that everything goes the way God has designed it. I know, Jeez. I know you're going to say to me, Rod, I've never heard, any heard like I've never heard any of this in my life. I know. That's why God brought you here to listen to me today. Somebody has got to tell you this. There's two two sides to volition. There's two poles. P O L E. There's positive and negative. Like electricity, there's a positive and a negative. And it's really important. These are freedom to choose. Positives and negatives. The positive, as a believer, the positives go with the word of God. The positive always line up with the word of God. The negatives always are against the word of God. Positives are always for the word of God. The negatives are always against it. The negatives are going to be, well, I, I heard him say that, but I didn't, I, didn't, I didn't accept that. I didn't believe that. But see, that's the disciples of Jesus Christ. He's told them over and over and over again, he's got to go to Jerusalem. He's going to be arrested. He's going to be tried. He's going to be crucified. He's going to be buried. He's going to rise on the third day. Everybody heard him. Nobody believed him. Not one. It didn't fit their agenda for the Messiah. They were looking for somebody to come and set up an eternal kingdom. They were looking for the millennium. What are you looking for that's not in your realm of time, events, and volition? I don't know. Matthew, the 21st chapter, verses 28 through 32. Jesus gives a parable on the subject. The two sides of volition. He said there was a father that had two sons. He came to the sons and he said, he came to the first son and he said, son, go work in the vineyard. The first said, son, I will, but he did not go. He came to the second son and he said, son, go to work in the vineyard. The son said, I will not. But afterward, he regretted, met and he went. So Jesus asked the question, which of the two sons did the will of the father? Can you answer that? Listen, as a teacher, here's what I don't want to hear. Would you repeat the question? <laughs> because apparently the teaching didn't matter to you until it came down to some kind of self-approval. Would you repeat the question so I could get it right and look good? You got to quit that foolishness. That's the stuff that gets you in trouble as a believer. You don't pay attention to the word of God. You're like the disciples. You show up and don't learn. Gnosis, if all you get from the word of God is information, gnosis, you will be among the most miserable in your life. I tell you, when I have somebody ask me to repeat the question, you can tell how it's a burr under my saddle. Now, you should be able to answer that question. It's a really simple parable. 
And if you could answer it properly, you would come out with the one who said, I will not, and then afterward regretted it, felt remorse over the way he talked to his father in authority over his life. And he did it. What did he do? Listen to me. Now, here it is. See, you're not getting any of this. I don't know why. You're not paying attention. What was the point of the parable? Doing the will of the Father. The will of the Father. Not your will. The, listen to the first son. I will and didn't. Listen to the second son. I will not and did. So what is it, what's at war? The wills are at war. Where is that coming from? Volition. They were, both were negative, and then one turned negative to positive. And what did it make it positive? Doing the will of the Father. Boy, what a simple parable and complex, isn't it? Wouldn't it be wonderful if we could get the church of Jesus Christ to do that today? Jesus said something in this parable that people miss because you couldn't even answer with son. You didn't pay any attention. He started this parable with a very important statement that if you said it in the teachings of Jesus, whenever he said this, you took notes carefully. He said, truly I say to you, if you've ever followed the teachings of Jesus, when he says that, you write every bit down, and you'd better get it because you're going to see this come back to your life. A teacher would do that repetitiously. You know you're going to see it on a test, and it would be graded high. So let's see what we see. Truly I say to you means pay attention. A really simple parable, did you get it? Let me ask you three questions. Did you see the difference in positive and negative volition in the sons? Now, I told it to you, but did you see it before I told you? Let me ask you another question. Did you see the connection between positive volition and believing regarding the will of the Father? See, they both heard, and they both understood what the Father said. In the beginning, they both went negative. Because neither of them, one said, I'm not going to do it. The other said, I will do it, and didn't. The one regretted and did it because he believed. He had to believe in order to do the Father's will. In other words, he had, uh, he had some opposition. When he first heard the Father's will, he went, I'm not going to do that. I'm not going to do it. Because he had something in his head that had another agenda. No, I'm, I'm going to go with my friends to the mall. We're going swimming today. Not going to work. And he went, look, my father asked me to work in the vineyard. He's authority. It is his will. I'm going to do that. He had to believe the father's will. He had to change negative to positive, and believe and do the Father's will. You can't do the Father's will until you believe it, until you accept it. Did you get that? Huh? Did you understand the difference between primary positive volition and secondary? 
Do you see the difference between primary negative volition and secondary? With the first son, primary negative volition, listen, primary negative volition, no, it was there, but he pretended, he was play acting, I will, but what he was saying in his heart, I won't. That's primary negative volition. His mouth said, I will, but his heart said, I won't. But I'll tell my father what he wants to hear. But I'm still going to do what I'm going to do. Primary negative volition led to secondary negative volition. Primary negative volition, oh, father, I will do it. His heart says, but I'm not going to do it. I'm going to do what I want to do. And secondary negative volition, he did not do it. He did his own will. He's a phony baloney. He's one of those guys that talks the game and can't walk it, don't want to walk it, won't walk it, but tells you and makes you think you do. They tell, they tell the person in authority what they want to hear. A smart authority over the person is not going to let them to get away with it. Well, anyhow, do you understand the difference between that? Do you understand primary positive volition is you, you got to hear it, understand it, and believe it? So that when it comes time to be secondary positive volition, applying it and completing it, it can get done. See, that's the will of God. The will of God operates in your life over primary and secondary volition operation. See, you have a positive and a negative pole. You have a primary and a secondary. On each side, a primary and a secondary. Positive volition, primary, secondary. Negative volition, primary, negative, and secondary. You have a primary and a, and a secondary. You can, listen, I just ask you, did you see it in the sons? You can call it what you want. I just explained to you what primary and secondary. This it's a language of accommodation is all I'm using. But I, I showed you how it worked out in the first son's life. He, he, he talks it. He, he, he fakes it. He pretends. He's a phony baloney. He, he play acts. He thinks he can get by. Smoking you all the time. Let me tell you, you can't smoke God for one minute. <laughs> so what's my point? My point is this. The importance of volition in the Christian life, there's two poles. There's a positive volition. There's a negative volition. There's a primary and secondary on each side of that. you got to be aware of it in your life. Don't be a phony baloney. Here's point number four. Oh, by the way, you, over there on, on point number two, you ought to be able to put primary and secondary on those sides and see that. I'm just telling you, if you've been in my church very long, you ought to be able to do that exercise. Point number four in closing. During the church age, it is the responsibility of the indwelling Holy Spirit to teach and recall the Word of God as truth in your life. The Word of God that you're being taught from the pulpit better be the truth because that's what you're going to base your whole life decision processing on. Well, how will I know if it's the truth? You've got to become a student of the Word to know the Word always stays consistent. He's not going to tell you one thing and then turn away and say, oh, well, you know, that's not really true. Yeah, yeah, yeah. The consistency of categorical Bible doctrine, being able to look at a subject matter and study it thoroughly to get a hold of it. During the church age, it is the responsibility of the indwelling Holy Spirit to teach and recall the word of God is truth in the Christian life. 2 Corinthians, the third chapter, 16, 17. We talked about it earlier. 2 Peter 3, 18. You grow in grace and knowledge of the Lord Jesus Christ. You grow in grace and knowledge. Are you growing in grace or are you growing in law? Law is a hindrance to it. the law. Under the law, you quench the Holy Spirit. You're a carnal believer under the law. You'll always be a carnal believer. 
Go back, go back and look at last week's lesson. Read the book of Galatians. The whole book, is that's the subject, the theme of the book. You were running well. Who hindered you? What hindered you? <coughs> this it, teaching, recalling ministry of the Holy Spirit to the Word of God is available to every church-age believer. You have to put yourself in a position to be taught so that the word can be, can be taken and digested into your spiritual growth momentum. A ba baby believer, an immature believer, a mature believer, a super gracer believer is the ministry of the Holy Spirit digesting within the growth, telling you exactly how, what is necessary to sustain you as a baby believer, an immature believer, a believer... Uh, a mature believer and a super grace believer. All these people have different levels. It is the responsibility of the Holy Spirit to put it in there. Let me explain. In the church that teaches the word of God for spiritual growth, momentum, in the Christian way of life, this principle that I am teaching you is essential that you know it. The indwelling Holy Spirit will teach and recall spiritual milk doctrines to a baby believer. Listen, you can come to a mature church like ours where the pastor teaches all levels in one lesson has got to teach baby, immature, mature, and super grace believers. I have to depend on the Holy Spirit as I enter into this. I have to depend on him to give the people what they need, not knowing who is, who is what and where is when. But I am confident that I know this. That the believer that sits here, that's a baby believer, can get what he needs and the Holy Spirit will teach him, recall it, to his life to cause him to have spiritual momentum and can take to the immature believer who is not a baby but an immature believer, not a mature believer, but an important believer in the church. And he can take that word of God in that one Bible study and reduce it into the life of that person that meets his need, both of these two people are going to walk away with a, with a doggy bag of Bible doctrine. They're going to be given more than they can digest. They take what they can. The Holy Spirit takes it and makes it applicable to their life where they are. That's teach and recall. To the mature believer, when he comes and sits down, very seldom does he need a, a doggy bag because he's heard it and heard it and heard it and he's out ministering it. He does a little here and a little there and a little here and a little there because the Holy Spirit is now taking him to a mature level of how it works in his life and how it works to others. When he hits super grace, he comes to Bible study, he sits in there and he's listening to how to teach other people because his majority of his life is dedicated to the lives of other people. He spends very little time on himself and spends most of the other time on other people. And the Holy Spirit is using the Word of God in a completely different manner to his life in outreach. This is the teaching recall ministry of the Holy Spirit in a, in a mature church. The Holy Spirit will take milk doctrines to baby believers. He will take milk and meat doctrines to the immature believer. He will take meat doctrines to the mature believer and the super gracer. And he will pound upon them the importance that you ought to be teachers of the word. When you hit mature and super grace maturity, the Holy Spirit is saying you need to know this to tell other people because their faith and their life is dependent on it and you need to be accurate. So let me conclude. When you quench this, the Holy Spirit of the teaching recall ministry 
by your negative volition, listen to me now, you're going to retrogress in your spiritual growth. Now, the only place you can retrogrowth is in immaturity. You can't retrogress from being a baby. Retrogression starts with immaturity, goes to maturity, and then to super grace. And here's the passage. You ought to write this down. You know that when you come to Bible study, you're supposed to have a Bible, a piece of paper, and a pencil. Hebrews 5, 11 through 14. One day I'll come back and I'll talk in great detail about retrogression. You can see it in the life of Jonah for sure. That's all I got today for you. I don't want to carry you past your lunch hour. I probably have. I didn't mean to. Try to get one hour in and you eat and I teach. Father, we're so thankful for these that have come our way today to study with us on Wednesday at the 1130 hour luncheon. Those who brown bag it and catch his father on the YouTube or wherever they find us. May this encourage your hearts. If, you're, if you believe that Jesus died for your sins, was buried and raised from the dead, the third day the Holy Spirit dwells in you, and he has a teach and recall ministry, a, a, a ministry of fire within you to stimulate your spiritual growth so that you can learn to share with others the truth that has set you free. Jesus said you will know the truth, and the truth will set you free. Father, we're so thankful to be set free from the ruler of this world who has come to destroy, kill and destroy, burn down. And we've come, Father, to give life and to give it more abundantly through Jesus Christ. And I pray, Father, the church of Jesus Christ would be adequate for this time in our nation and other nations that are under this crisis. The church has the answer. It is the gospel of Jesus Christ. In his name we pray. Amen.